So, good afternoon, people. Welcome. Um, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm from Docker. I'm going to have a chat with you about our orchestration of containers. Uh, before we kick off, um, who's familiar with Docker already? Good, good. So this is not going to be a Docker introduction talk. Um, who is familiar with orchestration already? A lot less. Who is uh, using Swarm in production? Who is using Kubernetes in production? Good. So on average, uh, we should be good to go. Uh, this is more a talk on uh, what are the things you keep in, uh, need to keep in mind when moving containers towards production environments. So it's not going to be a deep dive on orchestration. It's more of the considerations on what kind of choices do you have to make uh, in regards to container orchestration. Uh, a bit about myself. Um, um, I've been playing around with Linux since 1997. Uh, first box I broke really good. Uh, fortunately, I got a lot better at it right now. Uh, uh, turned to uh, Linux in my professional career since 2003. Started off at the Dutch police doing all kinds of Linux stuff. Uh, and after about eight years at the Dutch police, I moved to a large open source vendor famous for its Linux distribution. Um, I joined Docker back in January of this year um, as one of the first guys in Europe. Uh, we started off with a real small team this year. Um, and the biggest challenge I have is I'm really bad at saying no, because when we started out uh, basically pointing Europe into regions, they asked me, Patrick, would you be okay by doing Northern Europe? And I said yes, uh, which results in the fact that I now get to travel to all of the cold countries. Uh, luckily, right now, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands are not that different from the Nordic countries, so it gets used to the, uh, to the actual cold over there. If we look at container adoption, um, container technology is, has been around for a while. Docker technology has been around for roughly four years right now, um, and we still haven't seen the end of the growth of the con usage of containers. Uh, the numbers you hear, see here right now, 21 million do Docker hosts. Those are the ones that are known to us, so not behind the corporate firewall uh, and regularly checking in with the Docker Hub. 24 billion image downloads from Docker Hub as we speak. Um, I think the most impressive number is the one we've done for 2017, which is 12 billion. So only half of this number is actually the image pools from Docker Hub in this year alone. And final number, 77,000% growth in Docker job listings. No, this is not jobs open at Docker the company. Um, we're a small company still, 400 people globally. This is the number of job listings that are out in the IT community for uh, companies actually looking for Docker skills. So if you, uh, you want to put something on your resume, Start with Docker and the recruiters will actually start uh, following you everywhere you go. With the growth of container use cases, um, also the uh, container adoption, also the number of use cases that we see for containers is growing quite rapidly. Um, where containers originally were mo more meant for modern type applications like microservices, architectures, etc. What we see nowadays is that um, the use case is slowly shifting towards traditional applications as well. To give you an example, um, we were talking to a customer um, when we first introduced Docker for Windows, uh, talking about Windows Server. Um, and one of the questions they asked us, can I pick up this old-fashioned .NET application I'm still running on Windows Server 2003 and put it in a container and run it on a 2016 version of Windows Server? Well, yeah, the answer, of course, was, uh, as always, yeah, technically you can, but why should you? Uh, the answer the, uh, the customer gave us was pretty surprising, um, which said, I will still have 100 Windows Server 2003 instances running old-fashioned style .NET applications. Um, I'm paying a lot for support on that, for just a couple of security fixes on the platform itself per year. Um, if I can containerize that application, 
move all its dependencies in the container, and I can move it around. I can just pick up the container, deploy it on a new version of Windows, and I can get rid of those old-fashioned operating systems. Yeah, so, yeah, pretty good use case. So we started working with this customer. Uh, after a while, uh, after deploying a couple of uh, applications on uh, Server 2016, they started looking at the applications again. Hey, wait a minute, now we've made this application actually portable. So we don't need to deploy this on premise in our own data centers. We can actually move it towards the public cloud if we want to. And then they came to the consideration that one, that old 2003 server was always the fact that they didn't uh, realize their public cloud strategy yet because they could, just couldn't move those old fashioned operating systems and their applications towards a public cloud environment. And containerizing those applications made it really, really easy. Enough for the traditional applications. Uh, just wanted to point out this is one of the fastest growing use cases we see out there in the market today. Um, but of course, other typical use cases to speed up your application development, deploy microservices, scale out architectures, those are still really valid use cases for Docker as well. Orchestration, why should I care about orchestration? If you're doing Docker on your local system uh, as a developer, you probably are very happy with the fact that you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure anymore. Whenever you put your container into a production environment, then suddenly that underlying infrastructure does become relevant. So uh, let's say we have a platform that runs 100 Docker hosts where we have to deploy our application on. Who knows where this container is actually running? Where are we going to deploy this? How are we going to expose this to the outside world? How do we make sure that our application is highly available? So if one of our Docker hosts goes down, that the application is uh, automatically rescheduled on a other host. How do we do networking, making sure that cont containers can actually interact with one another? And how do we handle persistent storage? Sure, we can have a Docker volume on our laptops, connect that to a running container, and we've got our persistent storage. We have to have those storage options in a large-scale environment as well. So basically, what orchestration is going to bring you is boils down to roughly four things. Automatic scheduling of your applications, high availability, uh, scaling, etc., things like that. Service discovery, where are my containers actually running? Because a container lifecycle can do go down to seconds or minutes. So a container can be living on host one, the one single moment, but half an hour later it can be running on a completely different host. The other two, networking uh, and volumes. So networking, connecting uh, containers towards each other so they can actually communicate. No typical application exists of only one application instance. There's always a couple of components that need to communicate with each other, and that is actually one of the tasks that a container scheduler actually has. Choices. There's a lot of choices out there. I named five in this slide, uh, there's actually a lot more choices to make in regards to container orchestration. There's the famous ones, Kubernetes, uh, really popular at this point in time. Swarm, also very popular. Uh, Mesos, DCOS, um, popular, but not really a container orchestrator from origin. It started out as a platform for compute resource scheduling and management. La later on, they added Marathon, which gave it uh, container orchestration capabilities. Rancher, they had their own orchestrator named Cattle. I'm um, not, not sure if you've seen the recent announcement from, uh, from Rancher. They're making the switch to Kubernetes. So they're still on there, but uh, they're going to make a change. So Kubernetes is going to be more uh, uh, the one that Rancher is going to be following on. New kid on the block, Nomad from HashiCorp. Um, doesn't have a large footprint yet, but might be interesting to look at. If we could look at the landscape currently, <coughs> two stand out, which is Swarm and Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is by far, at this point, leading orchestrator tool, most popular between, uh, especially in the developer community, um, because of its capabilities. Um, one thing that stands out to me is the top one, 
homebrew solutions. These are the early adopters in container landscapes. The ones that started to schedule their own containers while there wasn't any orchestrator available just yet that they could actually use. 20%, um, um, I've come across a few of them uh, while talking to customers, um, but I don't expect this number to, uh, to grow uh, very much in the near future. So I'm going to focus a bit on the two major ones, uh, which is Swarm and Kubernetes. Uh, starting over Kubernetes, um, it was announced mid-2014 by Google, right around the same time that Docker released their first version of the container platform as, a, as an open source solution. Um, and it's based heavily on Google's Borg. Borg was an internal project within Google, which they used to orchestrate containers. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea, in 2014, uh, Google already scheduled about 2 billion containers per week. That's 2 billion. So that's a couple of thousands per second. Every single search you did on Google was running inside a container. That's what the, one of the reasons they started with Google Borg. Um, they needed a scheduling solution to schedule all of those containers uh, across the environment. They released it as an open source version, uh, as V1 in 2015, and put it on the Cloud Native Compute Foundation as an open source project called Kubernetes. Uh, largest contributors to date, Google and Red Hat, the uh, famous open source company I just mentioned already. Um, these are the biggest contributors. Um, but you'll see a lot of different vendors contributing to the Kubernetes project as well. Interesting to see is that Kubernetes is a real uh, open source project on an open source governance. So the amount of commits you will actually see will be a large part from Google, a large part from Red Hat, but a fairly big chunk of all of the commits going into Kubernetes project is actually independent <coughs> software developers, not working on Kubernetes for their, uh, their employer, for example. The other one, Swarm, um, originally released by Docker in 2015. Um, that is nothing compared to the Swarm uh, we see nowadays. So the first version of Swarm was external to the Docker engine. Uh, you had to build up a server which then could talk to a lot of separate Docker engines to schedule your containers on top of it. We integrated it into the Docker engine, which we now call Swarm mode since version 1.12. So since that version, every single Docker engine you install, whether it's on your MacBook, whether it's on a Linux box, is capable of becoming a Swarm-enabled engine and capable of having those scheduling uh, uh, capabilities. It's fully open source as part of the Mobi project. Uh, it's a component we call Swarm Kit, which is basically added to on top of the, uh, the Docker engine. Um, it is an open source project, uh, but the main contribut uh, contributions to the project still come from us. So um, we are basically a driving force behind the project. So how do you choose the best fit for your organization? Uh, there's a couple of considerations to be made. Um, first of all, what are you using what are your developers using right now? A lot of times, there's basically two scenarios for an orchestrator to come into your environment. First of all is the developers have been developing applications in-house, need to uh, bring that to production, and they've been testing it on their local systems or development systems environments using Kubernetes or Swarm as their orchestrator of choice. In that regard, the, the choice that is being made is being driven by the development organization. The other way around is possible as well. Um, what you see happening is IT operations is basically trying to build a platform to provide to the developers so that they can land their applications on top of that. From that perspective, it's IT operations making the choice for the orchestrator. Um, that can be a good thing, that can also be a really bad thing. Because if you make the, right the wrong choice, you're going to force your developers to learn a complete new way of deploying their application. Yeah. 
if they're be, they've been used to uh, using Kubernetes in their development environment, and you're going to force them to use Swarm, you're going to force them to change the way they deploy their applications. So the other way around, yeah, it is something that you really need to consider and uh, work together to make the best choice for your organization. There are a couple of fundamental differences between the two. Uh, one of them is the cluster management capabilities uh, of both. Um, if you look at Kubernetes, Kubernetes has uh, clustering that requires some external components. So for example, for the configuration to be able to share it between all of the hosts in your environment, you'll need to set up an, uh, an external KV store. Uh, in most cases, etcd is used. Um, but you have to set that up manually. It takes a lot of work, it takes a considerable amount of knowledge to set up and to keep it up and running. If you look at Swarm, on the other hand, um, it has all of those features built into the engine. So it's relatively easy to set up. Setting up a Swarm cluster is basically two commands, running Docker Swarm in it on one engine, Docker Swarm join uh, on the other. There's differences in the CLI. So uh, Swarm uses the Docker command line interface. So every command you're used to, uh, uh, used to do from the local system is relatively close to what it's going to be like when running inside a Docker Swarm. Uh, Kubernetes has its own command line interface. Um, not that difficult as well, but it's something you have to take into uh, consideration when looking at orchestration. The other fundamental difference is how networking and storage are uh, handled. If you look at Swarm, for example, that relies on the underlying engine to handle networking and storage for you. So if you do a Docker network create on a Swarm cluster, it's the underlying engine actually creating the network for you, which either has a local scope to the engine or a global scope across all of the nodes in your Swarm. If you look at Kubernetes, Kubernetes takes a more open approach. They've got an API for networking, which you can just plug in any type of network infrastructure of your choosing. And in that case, Kubernetes is handling all of the networking towards your containers. So doing a Docker network create on a Kubernetes cluster will make absolutely no sense. Um, there's a lot to say for both. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, it's much more open, much easier to integrate with other solutions, other networks. Um, if you look at the Swarm side, networking is something that comes out of the box. You don't have to think about it. On the other hand, one of the mottos at Docker is batteries replaceable, uh, batteries included but replaceable. So if you want to integrate with your underlying network, it is capable by using Docker plugins for that. If you look at one of the biggest changes between the two, then we're talking about application develop, the deployment. Um, Kubernetes uses something they call pods. Swarm uses something we call services. They are quite different from one another. Um, and to make it more even more complex, Kubernetes also has a not notion of what they call services, which is completely different from what Swarm uh, uses as a service. I think one of the biggest advantages of Kubernetes pods is that a pod can have actually multiple types of containers running as linked applications towards each other. So you can have one pod with a uh, web server front end or a reverse proxy with an application server back end running inside the same pod, uh, allowing you not to create complex network configurations for those two to work together. Uh, one of the uh, advantages as well is you can run a pod and deploy it on one specific node. You don't have to worry about where is application uh, one, container one in that pod running, where is container two in that pod running. Difficult part is, okay, we've got the pod, now we have to expose that to the outside world. How are we going to do that? Then it becomes a bit more difficult because then you need a Kubernetes service in front, which is basically exposing your application uh, on the physical network and then load balancing all of the traffic towards your container pods. Services in Swarm, um, easier to manage, easier to create, but they have a limitation with regards to pods that they run exact replicas of each single container. So a service in Swarm is basically a set of containers 
um, which all run the same image, same functionality, which we automatically load balance across uh, when you uh, connect to that service. Exposing that service to the outside world is actually really easy. That is built into the service command. It's just adding a parameter, expose this service to this port or the outside world, and you're done. You get service discovery, you get DNS, uh, you get load balancing. So it's making that choice. Do I want to be able to set up uh, a complex application topologies, or do I want to go for a easier way to deploy my applications without having to worry about how does load balancing work, how do I set up a service in front of those applications, um, etc. As I mentioned, choosing an orchestrator is something you do both as a developer and as an IT operations. A couple of uh, considerations to make when you're actually a developer. If you want to use an application that's capable of auto scaling, that is something that Kubernetes can do out of the box. Swarm, on the other hand, doesn't have auto scaling capabilities just yet. Um, it will be coming somewhere in the near future, but uh, this is something that isn't, hasn't been high on our priority list just right now. One additional thing I want to mention about auto scaling. Um, most of the auto scaling uh, solutions right now look at it from an infrastructure perspective, which means you're going to be base auto scaling decisions on uh, metrics from the underlying operating system. In the case of Kubernetes, the, if I'm correct right now, the only implemented version is CPU. So you're going to base your auto scaling decision on the amount of CPU that is being used by the application. If your application is doing something gruelly wrong and is consuming a lot of CPU because of that, and you make a decision to auto scale right now, then you're just replicating your problems and making them even bigger than they actually are. So be careful when using auto scaling. Um, I've seen in the Cube project that they're actually working on something they call custom metrics. So you actually can start interrogating the application on actual application statistics. What is the queue size? How busy are you? How many uh, requests are you handling right now? And do you need actual help? Then we can start scaling. Uh, in my regards, much safer way of scaling up. Blue-green deployments. Uh, familiar with that? Mm, yep. So blue-green deployments, basically I'm deploying a service. I have 10 replicas. Uh, of that specific service, and I'm going to do a new version, and I want to test it out on three of the ten. And I want to uh, redirect a small bit of the traffic to the new version of my application before I start rolling it out on a larger scale. That is something that Kubernetes can do today. Swarm, on the other hand, doesn't have that notion yet. You can do it, but you have to uh, you work with a lot of workarounds. Then you have to consider the actual workload you're going to deploy. Is it mostly going to be really modern type applications uh, with complex application landscapes? Kubernetes might be the better fit. If you're going to deploy traditional applications, databases, uh, WebLogic, WebSphere, those kind of applications, uh, running in a tr rather traditional way, then Swarm might be the, uh, the actually be, uh, might be the better fit. It's much easier to bring a traditional application to a orchestration environment in Swarm than it is in on a Kubernetes cluster. The learning curve for developers, it's okay. Kubernetes, you need to learn how the Kubernetes command line interface works, um, how you deploy applications in Kubernetes, a couple of the concepts like services and pods deployments. That's something you need to learn, but it is achievable. Um, Swarm, on the other hand, is relatively easy because most of it, what you see in Swarm, you've already uh, played around with, with while using Docker Compose. A lot of that technology using Compose comes back in, uh, in a Swarm environment. Are you going to run old-fashioned Windows application, .NET, IIS, ASP.NET? Um, then Swarm, at this point in time, is your choice. That is the one that is capable of having hybrid clusters consisting of Windows and Linux nodes in one and the same cluster. Um, it is coming for Kubernetes, but that's uh, uh, still in, uh, in early stages. And as I mentioned, the application constructs. Um, 
Swarm uses YAML files. Basically, it composes also a YAML file, but it composes a format uh, that is known to a lot of people because they've been using Compose on their local systems. So when using Kubernetes, you need to learn how to code your application, lay out your topology in a Kubernetes YAML file. Looking at it from an ops perspective, however, things change a little bit. When we look at the learning curve, building a, a Kubernetes cluster, managing a Kubernetes cluster, word breaks my mouth every time, um, is pretty hard. It needs a lot of skills, it needs a lot of learning before you can actually start deploying a Kubernetes cluster into production uh, um, and, and manage that with, uh, yeah, with some confidence. Um, as I said, the installation is pretty difficult. Um, it's, it's relatively easy. You deploy a KV store at CD. You may have to make that highly available. You deploy your Kubernetes masters. Also relatively easy. Then it comes to networking. Basic out of the box, you get one big flat network to deploy your applications in, and then you want to start using uh, software-defined networks. So you got to integrate things like open vSwitch uh, or other networking solutions. Um, making that all, of, all of that highly available can be pretty difficult. The other thing is com cluster communications. Um, normally, uh, you would be want to encrypt all of the traffic between your nodes. This is something you can do within Kubernetes, but it doesn't do that out of the box. You have to set that up, integrate it with your own PKI infrastructure. Looking at Swarm, um, as I said, it is relatively easy. It's two commands to set up a two-node cluster. Um, learning curve is pretty easy as well. As I mentioned, it's the same Docker command line interface you've been using on your local system for uh, quite a while. Uh, and security is something we take pride in at Docker. Um, we have done a lot of security configuration by default out of the box. So if you deploy a swarm, uh, all of the nodes communicate with mutual TLS uh, between each other. Uh, certificates are auto-generated between the nodes, uh, are recycled every now and then. Um, you can interface with an existing PKI, but only through a couple of protocols. Um, looking at networking, in a swarm you'll get overlay networking out of the box. Overlay networking is basically a software-defined network which stretches the nodes in your cluster wherever your application is being deployed. Um, if you want to go and build external networks, you want to interface with your physical networks, for example, that's where uh, it's going to be a bit tougher when you're using swarm. Application deployment. As I mentioned, Kubernetes YAML file um, is extremely flexible, and I'm not uh, thinking you're actually going to read this or be able to read this. I just want to point it out as an example. Um, this is an example YAML file is deploying a WordPress instance with a MySQL backend. Um, because I didn't have room on the slide, um, I stopped at the WordPress service. So this doesn't, this doesn't include the MySQL service. This hopefully gives you an idea of how much possibilities you get when deploying an application landscape using Kubernetes. There is so much you can actually tweak and tune, um, and at the same time it can make deploying your application a bit complex if you're not really comfortable with this kind of setup. However, it is really flexible. You can create extremely complex application setups uh, and tweak it to your, to your findings as, uh, uh, as much as possible. On the other hand, this is the version you would use in Docker Swarm. Uh, it's almost identical to the one I just uh, showed you, but this does introduce MySQL in the same page. Um, advantages of this, it's relatively easy, easy to use. And for the ones that have used Docker Compose, who has to use Docker Compose, a lot of hands, this should look rather familiar. Downside, it's not as flexible as the example I just showed you um, in the beginning of the slide. 
So if you want to choose, um, it's going to be a journey on, okay, um, typically a journey on, should I choose the red pill, should I choose the blue pill? Most important considerations, what type of applications am I going to run? Is it tr more traditional, slightly uh, towards uh, microservices architectures? Then Swarm might be the best fit for you. If you look at more modern type applications, 12-factor web apps, uh, modern uh, microservices architectures with complete uh, complex structures, then Kubernetes might be the best fit for you. Scaling requirements. Um, there's two scaling requirements you have to look into. As, uh, Swarm can scale up to thousands of nodes. Kubernetes was built to scale even further than that. So depending on your cluster size, you'd have to look into either one of those. Uh, on the other hand, auto-scaling, if that is an important feature for you, then Kubernetes might be the better fit. Are you going to do multi-platform? Is it only Linux in your data centers? You can choose either, either one. If you want to go towards Windows, then Kubernetes is not, probably not the right one for you to choose at this point in time. It will be in the future, but at this point in time, Windows supporting Kubernetes is just not there yet. Um, if you look at Swarm, on the other hand, uh, we do Linux, we do Windows, um, we just announced uh, the capability of actually running Z, uh, Linux on uh, Z mainframe from IBM, so you can actually start adding your mainframe uh, instances into a existing Swarm environment and run your applications on there. Another consideration is what is your skill level? Um, I think the skill for a developer is something that is relatively easy to gain. It's, it's not as steep as a learning curve for a developer as it is for a infrastructure IT operations person. That is where the real difficulty is going to be. So if you have a lot of skills in-house, you're used uh, to manage complex infrastructures, then Kubernetes is absolutely a, uh, a viable option. If you don't want to build that skill uh, and you want something that is easy to use, easy to maintain, then Swarm, swarm but, uh, would be probably be the, uh, the, better, the better one. Consider your cloud strategy. So, okay, containers helps you make your applications more portable. Um, so you can actually move them around between cloud providers. There's one thing you have to keep in mind with both types of orchestrators. Most of them bring you a lot out of the box. Software-defined networking that fully abstracts away the underlying network infrastructure for you. Um, and the same goes with storage. You can provide storage volumes towards your application without actually knowing what kind of physical storage is underneath your platform. If you're going to go for complex setups, um, you tend to go way down into the underlying infrastructure. And that's going to limit you on where you can uh, actually start you deploying your applications. Um, so if you go for orchestration as well, take into account how much freedom do I want to have moving around between on-premise, physical, virtual, or public cloud. And um, I cannot stress enough, orchestration impacts both the developer and the operations. So developers might be the ones that love using Kubernetes, but if you start pushing that to IT operations and they don't have the capabilities of managing such a platform for you, you might get into big trouble. Um, on the other way, um, if the IT operations team is already building a queue platform for our developers to run on, well, 80% of the developer community in your company is already using Swarm. You're forcing them to move away from something that might give them just the amount of tools they need to actually deploy their applications the way that they want to deploy their application. So it's always a tough challenge, but you need to figure out a way that both parties can actually uh, cater each other. So, um, who's been in this morning's session with my colleague Patrick? Or Patrick, what should I say? So, um, he, he did a demo on uh, Kubernetes integration in Docker. Um, I thought it was only fair to do a quick demo and give Swarm some uh, exposure as well. So, what I want to do is uh, deploy a fairly basic application, um, which is a web application which has two components. Um, going back to the first slide with the introduction slide, I have an infrastructure background, so one big warning. 
I'm not a software developer, and I will probably never will be, as you will probably see during this demo. Um, I'm not good at it, I will probably never be good at it, but hey, I like doing demos. Application, what it does is, I've got a front-end application. Um, it's a Python application that basically serves up a web page, um, and it pulls an image from a image server that runs in the backend. Sounds really easy. I want to uh, basically separate the image server from the front end, so I'm going to deploy the image server in a separate uh, backend network um, so that it is not reachable from the outside world. And the only thing I want to expose to the outside world is the actual image front end. So I've built a compose file for that. Um, relatively easy setup. Um, I'm going to deploy two services to my Swarm. One is the front-end server. I'm explaining to the front-end service which image it should use. It comes from my private registry. I'm going to expose that internally to the network on port 5000. I'm uh, deliberately not exposing the port on the outside network. Um, I'm going to connect it to two software-defined networks, two overlay networks, as we call that in Swarm. Uh, one is the UCP HRM network, and the other is a backend network. When I deploy that, I want Swarm to create six replicas of the application for me. So I've got a service which is running six containers doing exactly the same thing, and I'm going to load balance across them. And uh, the final thing you'll see is a label that I attach to it. Um, this is a nifty little feature in uh, Docker EE which basically allows me not to just publish a port, but publish my application based on a host name. So I don't have to know which port my application runs on, I just deploy it, it listens to all HTTP requests coming in, looks at the HTTP header, decides, okay, this is for this application, and it routes it into my container platform. Backend is my image server, uh, basically just an nginx uh, running a couple of animated GIF pictures, um, I want that connected only to the backend network, so I'm not going to expose that to the outside world. Um, and in this case, I want three replicas behind a load balancer uh, running there. Uh, the final few lines is basically me declaring all of the networks I use. So if you see, uh, if you look closely, you'll see that the H UCP HRM is defined as an external network, which is basically telling my swarm don't create this when I deploy the stack. It's an already available network in my environment. The backend network, uh, however, is specifically built for this stack, so I hope that uh, Swarm will actually deploy that for me. Pretty simple example, right? Don't see people thinking, oh, no. <laughs> Good. Uh, let's see what happens when we deploy this to a Swarm. going to uh, tell Docker to do a stack deploy, uh, use this compose file, give the stack a name, um, and to make it a bit more visual, I'm using a tool which one of my colleagues uh, uh, created to visualize my cloud, my swarm environment. Um, you can see seven nodes in here, six Linux nodes, and the number seven is actually a Windows worker nodes. Um, so I'm really hoping that Swarm isn't going to schedule any of my Linux workloads on Node 7 during the demo. Um, let's see what happens. Um, it should create the network backend first, then it should create the service to front end, then it should create an image server. It should pull all of the container images from the uh, uh, private registry I built, deploy them, create networks, uh, load balancing uh, rules for all of those containers, and it should have published it on a URL that I gave as a label on the compose file. You see it actually works. Um, you also see my incredibly devastating programming skills. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is we'll see the container ID. This is actually one of those six front-end containers that's been serving this web page. Uh, the actual image itself comes from that backend, which is not available to the outside world. If I load balance, uh, refresh that page right now, you'll see the container ID change. 
Now, if for some strange reason people actually like this work um, and start visiting my site quite frequently, um, I want to scale this out. Any suggestions? How many containers do I need? I did 100 yesterday. It, it worked, but it almost killed my cluster, so I'll stick to 50. Um, reason why it's killing my cluster is I'm running this on Amazon. Uh, Amazon is pretty expensive, so to save my company a bit of money, I'm running rather uh, small instances uh, of the environment. Let's go back to my visualizer, if I can find my mouse. And you should see it spinning up uh, an, uh, an additional load of front-end containers and move it towards 50. This is what basically how easy it is to deploy an application. If you've, used, if you've been using Compose, then it's not going to be a lot different uh, than using Swarm. On the other hand, why choose at all? Um, who's seen the announcements from DockerCon? A couple of hands go up. Good. Um, one of the things that the survey I used in one of the first slides, which told you how much usage we see in the market right now of orchestration platforms, tells us is uh, that a third of the Kubernetes users is actually reporting that they're also using Swarm. Why is that? There's two reasons that customers can actually do that. One is they haven't made a final decision yet and they're still trying to discover both, which fits our organization best. The other one is that it's a thing that's been driven, been driven from the development uh, teams. Part of the teams are used to working with Swarm and Compose. Other parts have been using Kubernetes for a while. Um, and companies don't want to force either one of those teams to start moving in a different direction and start working in a different way. Um, so that's why we decided to integrate Kubernetes as an orchestrator into our Docker EE platform um, as well. Um, so now we can actually provide our customers with choice on which orchestration toolkit to use. One of the main goals we have for that is make uh, make it simple, because we realize that uh, managing a Kubernetes environment and deploying a Kubernetes environment is relatively complex, and we want to take that complexity out of the equation for that. Uh, the other uh, consideration we had in mind is we need to make, stay focused on the developer experience. So a developer should be able to use the same commands, deploy his applications in the same way on his local system as he would do in a large-scale production environment. Um, one of the reasons we've been getting this request, I mentioned it already, a lot of uh, customers actually have multiple teams making different choices. So we see uh, quite some customers that actually have two types of orchestration going on in the development teams. And when the developer teams start pushing for containers in production, IT operations, is standing with the back to the wall, okay, what kind of choices do we need to make here? Typically, they don't want to make that choice and want to provide both options. Um, customers also help us, make Kubernetes, help us make Kubernetes more easy to use because that is one of the biggest challenge. Uh, when using an open source community version of Kubernetes, you've probably got a lot of skill in-house. Large enterprises rely on large IT operations teams, and if only one or two people of those have actual dis actually the skills to man maintain and manage such an environment, you're pretty screwed. So uh, looking at the Docker Enterprise Edition platform, um, and, and don't want to make it a too commercial talk, but there's more to it than just orchestration. Um, the thing that I've been talking about for the past half hour, 40 minutes, is basically where the arrow is pointing at. It's only a small part of running containers in production um, at scale. And what we're doing right now with the introduction of Kubernetes is making that part uh, something you can choose as a user without having to think about how to install it and how to maintain it. What does it look like technically? 
uh, simply, we already have Swarm. We looked at the complex part of running a cluster management solution for Kubernetes, which is basically all of the security, uh, uh, encrypting the network communication between hosts, storing the uh, configuration in an external key value store. Those are the things that Swarm already does out of the box. So why not integrate Swarm's cluster management capabilities with Kubernetes so you don't have to worry about that anymore? Why manage two clusters was one of the things we had in mind as well. Why not have one big cluster that is capable of deploying Kubernetes applications and Swarm applications at the same time? So every node in your cluster is actually capable of receiving a Kubernetes environment application or a Swarm application at the same time. They both listen to the both APIs uh, and on the front you just decide do I want to push a Kubernetes YAML file to this environment or do I want to push a compose file to this environment? When you add a node to the cluster, it's going to be as simple as Docker Swarm join. And then the magic starts happening. That node you just added to that swarm is automatically configured to be part of the same Kubernetes cluster as well, making sure that all the connectivity is set up, that it has the place to st uh, store its uh, shared configuration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As I mentioned, uh, one of the other important things we have in mind is that user experience all the way from development towards production. Um, we want to make sure that when you move an application through the software supply chain, you shouldn't be introducing developers to new things because then you're making their work a lot more uh, complex. So for that reason, we're going to integrate Kubernetes into the Docker for Mac uh, and Docker for Windows clients as well. Uh, and what you'll get out of the box when you download and install Docker for Mac, you'll get the look and feel you're used to, command line interface, but we add something. Under the hood, you'll get a really small Kubernetes environment uh, running uh, right next to your Docker environment without you knowing it. And we're going to introduce the Kube CTL command line interface uh, for your users on there. So you can actually deploy a full Kubernetes application on your local, local MacBook or your Windows desktop or whatever and deploy it in exactly the same fashion as you would do in your large-scale production environment. And we're adding all of the features that Docker EE brings on top of orchestration. As I mentioned, orchestration is only a really small part of the puzzle. Um, so there's a lot of security features uh, 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 that we bring to the table. Role-based access control, if you're going to have multiple development teams use the same environment. All those tools uh, are already in the Docker EE platform. We're integrated tightly with Swarm, and we're going to integrate those with Kubernetes uh, as well. And if you want to play around with it, um, we're all going to open up a beta program probably in the fourth quarter, so um, hopefully before the end of the year, so we actually make fourth quarter. Uh, if you're interested, go to docker.com slash Kubernetes, sign up, uh, and we'll send you information on the beta program later on. Uh, and the idea is that we have this available for our customers to start using it in production, enterprise grade, in Q1 of 2018. So it's going to be available for Docker EE standard for Linux. Um, reason for that, as I mentioned earlier in a couple of slides ago, Windows capability is not yet available in Kubernetes but we'll follow later on uh, in the row. So that's what I wanted to explain to you. If you have any questions, feel free to fire them, uh, fire them up. Um, and otherwise, I want to thank you for your attention and have a great day. <laughs>